Welcome back, everyone, as we continue our look at the Crimean War from Extra History. If you have not seen the first four episodes, which are in two videos, uh, there's a link in the description that will take you all the way back to the beginning so that you can catch up on where we are. The link will also be in the description to Part 5, so you can check that out without my commentary. I believe there are seven parts to the original video, plus kind of an extra one that talks more in detail about the events of the Charge of the Light Brigade. Uh, so we'll be doing five and six today, and then we'll do those other two episodes in tomorrow's episode. As always, once this video goes live for the public, you can already see the next episode. If you're a member or a patron, thank you to everybody who just signed up in the last few days. Your support does make a tremendous difference on the channel, especially at this time of year. Because after Christmas, ad revenue plummets, and it's a lot harder to pay the bills. And uh, we're trying to grow the team. We're trying to add some new things that we want to be able to provide to you uh, from this collection of channels that I manage. Uh, so your support goes a long way to making that happen. Let's go ahead and dive in. Outside Sevastopol, January 1854. Each day begins and ends with artillery, with Allied ships firing on the fortresses protecting Sevastopol. Ashore, more guns entrenched in earthworks pound the rigid forts protecting the city, the most feared of which, known as the Malikov, has a stone tower giving its battery of guns a panoramic view. So, as is often the case when foreign nations go to war, and by foreign I mean nations other than your own, uh, often the militaries of neutral nations will send observers because even if you're not participating in a war, you can still learn from the war. And in the case of the United States, one of their official observers, there may have been others, I don't know, but I know for sure that an official observer at this siege watching all of this unfold is a young George B. McClellan, who is there as an official observer uh, watching these events. And then he's going to report back to his own military about what he saw, about the tactics, about the use of the different weapons so that the U.S. military, which is very small and, and pretty minor in the grand scheme of things at the moment, uh, is able to learn something from all of this. From there, the Russian guns answer. This is a war of artillery and mud, of sharpshooters and trench raids, one where bodies it's lie are buried in no man's land. But the real killers are not the cannons. I mean, the... think about that. Artillery, the number one killer in the First World War. Trench raids, mud people dying and being left in no man's land that is world war one to a t but this is 60 years earlier rifles it's the disease the lack of food the poor tents that let the rain in the lack of resupply that sees troops still wearing summer coats in winter wearing blankets as their uniforms rot off their bodies hmm. there's no wood or charcoal for fires men sleep in huddles so they don't freeze overnight forget the russians the allies have a new term for their greatest enemies General January and General February. Mm. And this is a situation where, as we've already talked about, the high command for the British, uh, less so for the French, but more for the British, are not exactly prepared to lead troops in this sort of war. Uh, and this is where keeping up the morale is so vitally important. And, and it's less about the generals in that case and more about your lieutenants and your captains, uh, your field grade officers, the guys who are on the ground with you. What are they doing to keep your morale up, to keep you prepared, to keep you focused? It's hard work. Would you like to see a full episode dedicated to the military machinations that caused the Charge of the Light Brigade once you finish this one? Well, with Nebula first, you can see it right now a full week early, but more on that later. By January of 1855, the British public was up in arms. They'd read reports of troops dying of exposure outside Sevastopol, of rations that rotted on the docks of Balaclava, partially due to bureaucratic red tape and partially because the roads were bad and there were no horses. While the French had issued their troops sheepskin coats, British soldiers, by contrast, froze to death. That does not help your morale situation when your allied forces have sheepskin coats and you don't. Then, this process of public opinion turning against the war accelerated during the siege of Sevastopol, because the nature of the war at this point meant that there were fewer bigger battles to report on, and journalists instead turned toward reporting mm. on army scandals. 
British leaders were so worried about these press reports, especially the reports written by William Russell, who Lord Raglan claimed was a traitor aiding the Russians, they decided to combat the printed word with the power of the image. They dispatched the photographer Roger Fenton to take patriotic photos of the conflict. Traveling in a special coach that served as his wheeled darkroom, Fenton photographed subjects that included famous battlefields, prominent personalities, and a haunting still life, the Valley of Death, showing a collection of cannonballs lying along a sunken road. He also engaged in outright propaganda, photographing soldiers in warm jackets and hats that the army did not actually manage to issue until spring. Hmm. Yet the spin... So... Fascinating, because this is 1854. This is little more than a decade before photography is really becoming a major thing in the world. So this is really one of the first opportunities where an actual war that's happening can be photographed in any way. In fact, I want to take a, a, a minute here and actually look at some of these actual photographs. So these are all taken by Roger Fenton between March and June of 1855. Uh, there's the Valley of Death right there. It says the Valley of the Shadow of Death with the cannonballs. You can see right there. Uh, one of the most famous photos there is Sevastopol. Uh, in the distance, there's a ton of these uh, that are very similar. So we're kind of flying through some of them, and I'll stop on a few here and there. Uh, really, really fascinating. These are graves of generals who have been killed, uh, including the man standing here at the grave of Brigadier General Thomas Lee Goldie, who was killed at Inkerman. And this is actually uh, Inkerman in the distance there on that one. We talked about Inkerman in the last episode. Balaclava in the distance, a Turkish camp uh, over here on the right. There's Cossack Bay in Balaclava. And then there are some of actually uh, of, the, of the troops here that we'll get to in just a second. Uh, unloading ordnance from the ships. There's so many of these. So uh, here's Cornet Henry John Wilkin of the 11th Hussars. Look at that. Man, that is hardcore. Officers of the 47th Regiment. Major Adolphus Burton and officers of the 5th Dragoon Guards. And, and this is such a new thing. Here's a lieutenant general. Uh, in the history of warfare, for people back home to see these photos published and to actually be able to, instead of just hearing about it from news reports and letters home, uh, actually being able to see what their soldiers are seeing and what they're experiencing firsthand. This is such a revolutionary idea. Captain Lord uh, Balgoni of the Grenadier, Grenadier Guards. Royal Highlanders there. Awesome. Really cool stuff. It was too late. People had enough. In late January, 1,500 Londoners protested the war by mm. barraging pedestrians, buses, upper-class coachgoers, and police with snowballs. Public criticism led to the Conservative Party losing a vote of no confidence and being swept out of government, replaced by the highly anti-Russian Lord Palmerston. And then an unbelievable thing started to happen. Civilians became so sick of hearing about military failures that, in perhaps the most Victorian move imaginable, they decided to just step in themselves and fix the problems. Newspapers collected money to buy the army food and medicine, and women across Britain knit balaclava hats for the soldiers. Meanwhile, a group of railway engineers solved the commissariat's logistics problem by building the Grand Crimean Central Railway. And so here you have a glimpse of what will be a very common staple in the 20th century warfare is the, the stuff going on on the home front to support. Not that it didn't happen before, but a, a concerted effort to support the troops in any way you can instead of just staying at home and just praying for your soldiers, actually doing something to help the situation because you feel like your government's not doing enough. A rail line that could ferry supplies from the port of Balaclava up the 600-foot plateau to the siege works around Sevastopol. Similarly, telegraph companies laid lines all the way to Crimea, so by 1855, generals could communicate directly with political leaders and war news arrived in Paris and London within hours. And this is... This is six years before the start of the American Civil War, and a lot of the things you're seeing here, using the rails to uh, move troops and supplies to the front quickly, using the telegraph to be able to communicate effectively with the fronts uh, back at headquarters. These are all things that are going to become features of the American Civil War.
Responding to the lack of Florence medical Nightingale. care, London Hospital Administrator Florence Nightingale, who I'm sure will get her own episode of our show in the future, trained and deployed nurses to treat men evacuated to Constantinople. But she wasn't the only one. Mary Seacole, who you can see our series about here, did much of the same closer to the lines. In fact, the Russians had a similar nursing program, run by Nikolai Pirogov, a medical professor with links to the royal family. An innovator, Pirogov changed battlefield medicine forever. Hmm. He invented a triage system that ensured doctors worked on men that could be saved, wow. insisted that all operations be carried out under anesthetic, pioneered less dramatic amputations, and instituted the use of plaster casts. This is a common misconception people have about warfare during the 1850s and 1860s, especially here in the U.S. with the American Civil War. The idea that mass amounts of men were having limbs sawed off while they were wide awake, biting down on a bullet or biting down on a piece of wood or something. The vast majority, I can't speak to this war because I don't know as much about it, the vast majority of amputations that took place in the American Civil War happened under anesthetic. It's just in big battles they would sometimes run out of anesthetic and then you would have those incidents like that and when we hear about extreme incidents we tend to apply all situations to that extreme when that extreme was really the exception and not the standard yet while russia's supply and medical situation was bleak the war didn't have the same impact on their public's opinion at home or in france for that matter See, both were essentially dictatorships at this point that censored their press, with secret police forces that hauled citizens in for speaking negatively about the war, even in private. State newspapers claimed that Russian defeats were tactical withdrawals. Really, the public's one view of combat in Sevastopol came from a trio of short stories written by artillery officer Leo Tolstoy, published after the siege's conclusion. In them, Tolstoy took the reader on a tour around the besieged city, describing gritty details like the necessity of stepping over rotting horses, the shriek of cannonballs, or the horrors of the amputation ward. When you're dealing with a huge collection of men, like in an army, those men, many of them, are not soldiers for their careers. Uh, or if they are, they're still good at something else. So these are artists, and these are artisans and these are uh, factory workers and they're people who have other lives and very often the way that they process what they're experiencing in combat is to default to what else they know so if you're an artist you draw what you see if you're a writer you write about what you see and that's how you process it but how you also make some sense of all of it is to write about it and same thing happens in world war one you have these writers and even people who never were writers who turn to poems and 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 letters and stories to express what they're experiencing these sevastopol sketches established tolstoy's literary reputation across europe and he would later return to several of the incidents when crafting his epic novel war and peace Yet despite the propaganda and silencing of dissent, it was still clear to average Russians that the war wasn't going well. Rumors swept the country that the Tsar had declared that anyone serving in the army would be freed from serfdom, and as a result, mm. serfs flooded the cities, forming mobs that demanded to be enlisted as soldiers. Ironically, these hyper-patriotic uprisings occasionally had to be put down by the very army they were trying to join. As the war dragged on, the Russian government increasingly began to worry about a general uprising. Not only had prices spiked due to the Allies' economic warfare and shutting off the Baltic trade, the war's drain on men and livestock, mm. especially horses, damaged Russian agriculture. Rumors circulated that Russia was losing the war and that the Tsar had put them in a hopeless situation. So on March 2nd, 1855, when citizens first saw the black flag over the palace signaling the Tsar's death, it was popularly believed that Nicholas had killed himself. In a way, they were right. In the last weeks of his life, Nicholas had grown increasingly regretful about starting the war and despondent over Russia's inevitable defeat. Ailing from pneumonia brought on by the flu, to his inner circle, it appeared the Tsar simply stopped fighting the illness. Mm. Hopes of a quick post-mortem peace were dashed, however, when his son Alexander II continued the war. The it's amazing how often this happens that leaders of nations die during wartime. Abraham Lincoln dies, obviously he's assassinated during the Civil War. Uh, in World War I, you have Franz Joseph, uh, the Kaiser of uh, Austria-Hungary, dying in the middle of that conflict. Uh, in World War II, you have uh, Franklin Roosevelt dying. Uh, 
in the middle of the war. Uh, so really, really a common thing. Though really, things were slowly winding down. With winter over, Sardinia having joined the Allies, Austria threatening to do likewise, and an Allied fleet once again threatening St. Petersburg, there was simply no hope for Russian victory. The final blow came on September 8th, when a mass Allied attack smashed into the ridgetop forts. It was bloody and close. The first waves were repelled, but on the second wave, a Zouave planted the French flag on the ruined tower of the Malakov. By February 1856, diplomats were hammering out a treaty to end hostilities, the terms of which were surprisingly favorable to Russia. They would return all territory taken, as well as returning a piece of territory to Moldavia. Moldavia and Wallachia were made functionally independent under the Ottoman banner, and the Ottoman Empire joined the concert of Europe. As for the Black Sea, it was demilitarized. Neither the Ottomans nor Russia could keep naval forces or establish military posts there, a provision that only held for a few decades. But while it didn't change much on the map, the war served as a wake-up call for the major powers. The Russians took it as a cue that to survive, they had to modernize. Witnessing the effectiveness of British and French armies of free men, Tsar Alexander II went on to reform the state and abolish serfdom. And it's a big deal. It's a huge deal for, for Russia. It, it's, it's a step in the right direction in a country where you've had a lot of uprisings. Obviously, it's not going to be enough because we know that the um, the empire is going to be overthrown during the First World War, but uh, it staves off things getting worse, at least for a little while. And deciding Russia was not well-placed to defend Pacific territory, he sold Alaska to the United States. The Ottoman Empire, under financial pressure from its allies, granted more or less full equality to religious minorities and launched into technological reforms of its own. Though, oddly enough, the British push for reform failed. Conservative aristocrats cast any criticism of the military as unpatriotic. And soon, the 1857 uprising in India shifted public debate away from Crimea. Yet perhaps the war's greatest legacy is how it taught the world how to conduct a modern war. Yep. Trenches, rail lines, rifles, and sea mines. Those were the future for those that would see it. Because military observers from across the globe witnessed the action firsthand. Including oh, American is. officer George B. McClellan, who would go on to try... That's not how his name's spelled, though. There's no A in McClellan. It's just MC. And ...fail to create his own version of the Siege of Sevastopol during the American Civil War. Actually, as an odd aside, regard for French units was so high in the U.S. Yeah. that both sides of the Civil Zouaves. War would form Zouave regiments, essentially going into battle cosplaying as French soldiers. Humans are weird. So, ironically, a war that started over the custody of holy sites, a concern that seemed almost medieval, would end up showing us what modern military conflict looked like. From military rail lines to war correspondents filing their stories via telegraph, to modern military hospitals and trench warfare, the Crimean War truly foreshadowed the wars of the future. Even all right, so I don't know why I was thinking that there were several more episodes, but that actually was the last episode, and then we have the one uh, going into detail about the uh, events of the Charge of the Light Brigade. So uh, we'll go ahead and take a look at this one, and uh, I think there is a Lies episode that you can check out. I don't typically react to those, but that's available as well. You can definitely check that out over on Extra History. Clava Crimea, October 25th, 1854, 10.45 a.m. From a ridgeline, a general gazes down on the battlefield. His name is Baron Raglan, and he's been directing the action for the past five hours. Suddenly, he spots movement on a distant ridge. Enemy troops, dragging away cannons they'd captured earlier in the battle, Raglan's hero, the Duke of Wellington, never lost a gun, and Raglan swears he won't suffer that dishonor. So, he scribbles an order to his cavalry reserve, the Light Brigade, waiting in the valley below. Advance rapidly to the front, follow the enemy, and try to prevent the enemy from carrying away the guns. He watches as the cavalry sets off. But hold on, he realizes there's been a terrible mistake. They're not riding toward the intended target, but down a valley bristling with enemy artillery. Riding to death and immortality. All I can imagine is, I mentioned it the other day, Lord of the Rings, but in this case, I'm, now I'm not thinking of the situation where Faramir and his group ride to their deaths, but rather uh, the charge of the Rohirrim at Pelennor Fields where they're all yelling, DEATH! Man, I can't imagine what it must have been like for these guys. 
thanks so much to 80,000 Hours for sponsoring this episode. If you're looking for a career path where you can have a positive impact on the world, then stick around until after the show because they might be able to help you find your dream job for free. In episode 4 of our Crimean War series, we talked briefly about the Charge of the Light Brigade, a terrible blunder that became one of the most famous events in military history. And while that episode looked at the wider context, we really wanted to circle back and explore the mechanics of how and why it all happened. But first, a little recap. On October 25th, 1854, a Russian army attacked the Allied Ottoman, British, and French port of Balaclava, which acted as a vital supply link for the Allied forces besieging the Russian port of Sevastopol. While the Russians initially captured a series of hilltop forts, a regiment of Scottish Highlanders halted their progress. After that, a British cavalry unit, the Heavy Brigade, counterattacked and defeated the main body of Russian cavalry. Throughout so you gotta figure if there's a light brigade, there's probably a heavy brigade somewhere, right? Uh, no, this is pretty common practice to, uh, before you go after a strong point directly, try and weaken it any way you can. And if you can get out their supplies and cut off their supplies more effectively, it makes that hard, difficult to take strong point just a little less difficult to take. Out this, the British light brigade remained in reserve. While the Heavy Brigade were line breakers, the Light Brigade was intended for reconnaissance, flanking, and pursuing fleeing enemies. Yet after watching the Heavies in action, the Light Brigade was eager to win glory as well, so Baron Raglan decided to give it to them. A 65-year-old veteran, the commander of the Allied forces, had fought under Wellington and lost his arm at Waterloo, but that was 39 years before and Raglan hadn't seen combat since. At Balaclava, Raglan observed the battle from the heights above, and when he realized Russian troops were trying to evacuate guns they'd captured from the forts earlier in the day, he saw an opportunity to use the Light Brigade. He scribbled a vague order to his cavalry commander, Earl Lucan, directing him to send the Light Brigade to cut off this retreat and handed it to a messenger. Now, that messenger, Captain Louis Nolan, was a keen horseman and military theorist, who also had a fiery temper and an utter disdain for Lord Lucan, who he mocked and called Lord Lucan because Lucan had held his forces back and mm. watched during the earlier Battle of Alma. So, carrying Raglan's message, Nolan reached Lucan. Despite being an officer since 1816, Lucan had never fought in a battle before the Crimean War. In fact, he was more known for his ostentation, spending so much money on lavish uniforms that one of his regiments had been nicknamed Bingham's Dandies. Now, as far as the order was concerned, what Raglan wrote made sense, but only from his vantage point. The Light Brigade was ideally suited to capture the Russian artillery on the heights. The problem was, from where Lucan was looking, he couldn't see them. Raglan was looking at the situation from above, Lucan from below. So Isn't it fascinating how sometimes events unfold because of things like that, because of who your choice of messenger is, because of not understanding the difference between your vantage point and someone else's and, and not properly putting yourself in their shoes to understand what they're seeing uh, or just miscommunication. So confused at this order being delivered to him, Lucan asked Nolan for clarification. In response, Nolan insisted, Lord Raglan's orders are that the cavalry should attack immediately. Attack, sir? Barked Lucan. Attack what? What gun, sir? Nolan, exasperated, gave a wide sweep of his arm, a wave that not only encompassed the ridge with the retreating cannons, but also Russian fortifications in the throat of the valley over a mile away. Both sides of that valley bristled with Russian artillery and infantry. Any force that entered it would ride through a kill zone of 50 cannons and 20 infantry battalions a.k.a. a clearly suicidal attack. Jeez. There, my lord, is your enemy, Nolan declared. There are your guns. Lucan, annoyed and embarrassed by Nolan's tone, didn't question the orders again. He then told Nolan to carry the instructions to Earl Cardigan, who held direct command of the Light Brigade. A soldier since 1824, Cardigan was also a peacetime officer like Lucan and Raglan. Renowned for his aristocratic arrogance, he'd clashed with other officers on numerous occasions, including fighting several duels. He also, like Nolan, had a special distaste for Lucan, who happened to be his brother-in-law. Huh. Understandably, Cardigan also questioned Raglan's order. But when Nolan's response implied that Cardigan was afraid, he furiously replied, If I come through this alive, I will have you court-martialed for speaking to me in that manner. This is just all... I always knew about the Charge of the Light Brigade. I didn't know about the comedy of errors that went into making it happen. Uh... There are way too many stories like this. Then when Nolan left, Cardigan pointed out to Lucan how well defended the valley was. I cannot help that, Lucan said. It is Lord Raglan's positive order that the Light Brigade is to attack the enemy. 
Yeah, a vague order made due to military inexperience, miscommunicated, exacerbated by battlefield terrain, and filtered through a tangled mess of overweening aristocratic privilege and personal feuds. That is what put in motion what came next. And all of that leads to the death of guys who had no idea why they were having to do what they did. 11.10 a.m. The Light Brigade advances uh, past the intended target. Oh, no. Realizing the disaster is afoot, Nolan rides out in front of the formation, shouting and waving desperately. No one can hear him, so he comes closer to Lord Cardigan and... The first Russian shell bursts above. Nolan shrieks and drops from the saddle dead. Mm. The Light Brigade... To his credit, he did try to do something about it, which is more than I would have expected him to do. It sweeps over him. Russian guns roar, not only from ahead, but from left and right, sending men and horses tumbling. The Light Brigade speeds up from a trot to a canter. Then more batteries join the barrage. The horsemen break into a full gallop as hot iron slices through their formation. And onward they ride, through round shot, then shell bursts, then cones of flaying grape shot pellets. Onward through the steel and the dust in the blood, over falling horses and falling comrades, against all odds and all reason. But somehow, some of these 600 reach the Russian guns. Mm. They overrun them, hacking with sabers and stabbing with lances, wild and desperate. Still they continue into Russian Cossacks and Hussars behind, driving them back in a furious melee. But in the end, it's all in vain. The cavalry didn't have the means to destroy or seize the guns they'd captured, so exhausted... Yeah, what are you going to do? Grab them and take them back through where you just came and once again go under that same fire? This was such an impossible ask of these guys. ...and almost surrounded, the survivors finally turned back. Now, few might have made it out were it not for the efforts of their allies. A French cavalry regiment, the Chasseurs d'Afrique, managed to clear part of the valley, reducing the firepower being directed at the Light Brigade and allowing the survivors to trickle back. Of the roughly 670 British cavalrymen who made the fateful charge, 110 were killed and 161 wounded. Despite leading from the front, Cardigan actually survived. Wow. Though in the midst of the confused fighting, he did abandon the action and rode back to the British lines alone. Not to worry, though. That evening, he withdrew to his private yacht and ate a champagne dinner. The action brought the Battle of Balaclava to a close. The port remained in Allied hands, and almost a year later, Sevastopol fell, ending the war. In the months that followed, the dedication and bravery of the cavalrymen who'd made the desperate charge were celebrated, while the chain of aristocratic blunderers who'd ordered it were lambasted by some and exonerated by others. It just reminds me a lot of the common saying that wasn't entirely accurate, but was a common view in World War I, which was that these were lions led by donkeys. Uh, probably the same view that's had here. Uh, and yeah, I mean, you can imagine these guys being lauded for their bravery and all they're thinking of, it wasn't bravery, it was just survival. It was just us trying to make it through and the real heroes are the guys who died. I mean, that's the common attitude that people in these situations have. Initially, Raglan blamed Lucan for the debacle, but then he died of dysentery a year later, worn down by campaigning and public criticism of his command. Lucan, in turn, blamed Raglan and Captain Nolan, both of whom were deceased and unable to respond. Cardigan evaded responsibility entirely and instead used his involvement to enhance his reputation. In an official painting of the action, made shortly after the battle, he insisted the artist show him at the lead. However, the public became increasingly angry over the military incompetence displayed in Crimea, and though the change came slow, the army eventually took measures to ensure wealthy aristocrats couldn't simply buy their way into command. Meanwhile, the charge of the Light Brigade entered into the pantheon of renowned military incidents, a byword for both courage and foolhardiness. The yeah, it's, it's amazing how often we think of these things with, as such glorious things, all the charge of the Light Brigade, when really it was the product of stupidity and miscommunication and bad choices uh, that led to these poor men who were caught in the middle of it having to do what they did. Though regardless of the carnage, many of the survivors stated that they'd have done it again if ordered. Wow. Tennyson immortalized them in a poem that became part of school curriculums and to this day remains a favorite of English verse. Yep. Yet despite the Light Brigade's enshrinement as a patriotic symbol, after the war, the survivors of the charge found that they returned to a life of disability, pain, and poverty. 
In fact, in 1890, 36 years after the charge, the 20 survivors still living were nearly all paupers. Jeez. Author Rudyard Kipling, angered by this hypocrisy, decided to write a response to Tennyson's poem. And Rudyard Kipling, who will very famously lose his own son in World War I, uh, and he'll write about that. Have you seen my boy Jack? It's, it's a heartbreaking uh, series of writings that he does talking about his son. And uh, unfortunately, his son's body was never identified uh, during his lifetime, but has been identified since. And we're going to tell that story the next time I'm over there. Oh, 30 million English that babble of England's might. Behold, there are 20 heroes who lack their food tonight. Our children's children are lisping to honor the charge they made. And we leave to the streets and the workhouses the charge of the Light Brigade. Hmm. And as we all know... And he referred to workhouses. A workhouse was kind of a place for the destitute, for the elderly, for, for people who had nowhere else to go. And it wasn't, it wasn't like a, a nursing home where you were comfortable and fed and taken care of. It, it, it was not a place you wanted to end up. It was hard. It was a workhouse. If you were able to, you worked and worked hard. And the, the conditions were not fantastic, but it was where you went if you had nowhere else to go. My fourth great-grandmother died in the Dudley Union Workhouse outside of Birmingham in 1866. Uh, not a great place. Humanitarian issues like the one Kipling addresses here are nothing new, which is why we're really happy to tell you about our sponsor today, who's actively trying to help people. So yeah, check that out if you watch the video. Uh, this has been a fantastic series. I've learned a lot. I hope you have as well. Uh, it's not a war that gets talked about a lot, but it definitely is a war that has major consequences for, uh, for Europe and for the world in the years to come. Uh, so hope you enjoyed it. If you have any suggestions for other things you'd like me to take a look at, let me know in the comment section below. Thanks for watching.